started, some people started, they say, you go, you work, I don't know whether you will make profit or lo lose something, but I want my 10% over and above what I give you, <laughs> loan with interest. There were people from the very beginning. So we had, since beginning, two ways of direct finance, one based on interest-based lending, and the other based on some kind of sharing. Then direct finance was too limited in scope. We come to the age of financial intermediation, in which a third party comes between the owner of funds and the user of funds. They collect funds from a very large number of people and hand it over to a small number of people who have ideas, who can do business, who can organize firms. And this financial intermediation also started on two parallel tracks. One, loans based on interest, in which all the market risk is shifted over to the other party, and the owner of fund gets an assured increase over time. And the other forms in which this does not happen, some sort of sharing is involved. Now, this lets us know that man cannot live alone. There must be some cooperation. The basis of cooperation has to be very, it's a very delicate thing. If you live, live, leave it only for cooperation with no visible return in sight, cooperation becomes very weak. But if there is some assurance that you cooperate, there will be reciprocation. You will get back something exclusively for your benefit. Then cooperation is, gets some momentum. So we need a framework in which cooperation can be sustained. Over time, this framework, which worked successfully, was provided by two important things. One is private ownership of property. You own certain things, and the growth of those things come back to you as owner. And the other is freedom of enterprise. Nobody going to dictate you, constrain you, do this, don't do this, unless, of course, doing something involves harming other people. So this framework of ownership, private benefit from the results of ownership, and freedom of enterprise, the reward of enterprise returning to the entrepreneur, this gave a big flip to man's energetic pursuit of creating more wealth. And population increased, and civilization spread, and the market became borderless. You know the story. Now there is a catch. This proviso that you are free to pursue your interest but don't harm others, you will own what ever comes as a growth of the thing you own. You have a flock of sheep and it breeds and there are more sheep or you grow something and sell it in the market and it gives you more value than originally you put in the farming. This, both of these have limitations. The limitation of the second thing is that information is insufficient. You are a go very good person. You don't want to harm others. But do you know what harm is being caused? A man who starts a factory which emits carbon dioxide and monoxide in the air apparently thinks, what is the harm? He is not aware of what pollution in a small amount adds up to and causes ozone layer depletion and all that. So, Information is defic deficient, it's not widely shared, it 
occurs sometimes after you have taken the step and then some people sometime become short-sighted. Greed guides them. So they would not mind cheating if it brings a large benefit. Similarly, in the first instance of ownership-based benefits, there is a catch that the planet Earth, which is shared by human beings, doesn't belong only to the most physically fit, the most mentally alert, and the most knowledgeable. There are invalid people. There are people weak in mind, people weak in physique. They have to be sustained by the same earth. As the Quran says, and I am sure all scripture emphasizes, earth was made and abode for everybody, not only for the energetic and the men full of ideas. So even when you create some wealth, there is a share of some people whom perhaps you have not seen or you have not considered because they inhabit the planet with you. So we need an empire. We need a state. We need supervision. And supervision, I mean in a broad sense, some guiding institution, someone to spread information and restrain harmful action by individuals. Now, I submit that Islam, and I'm sure all faith leaders, provided this framework of freedom of enterprise and private ownership and state supervision but they provided something else which uh, capitalism, for example, did not provide. And that is they rooted these considerations into spiritual concerns. They taught man that one is accountable and if it pursues a moral course towards economic enterprise towards financial intermediation, it will bring eternal bliss. So the greed which self-interest breeds was tempered. I am reminded of a saying of the Prophet of which I will recite only the first part, talab. The best translation that I can give you is be graceful in your quest for money. Now, instead of being greedy, being graceful, that makes a word of difference. It simplifies the act of supervision and guidance. So in this session, which is going to listen to more learned, learned uh, inputs from experts on retail banking, the last thing I want to say is we in Islamic finance are conscious, and the recent crisis has made us more conscious of what is missing in the conventional approach to finance. Mm -hmm. And we realize that faith people, faith groups, as Honorable Reverend just told you, can provide that missing input. Right. That missing input is a God consciousness, grace, instead of greed, and a realization that the planet Earth is to be shared by everyone. Even if you are cleverer, stronger, more knowledgeable, you have a better network, you can amass wealth and use that wealth to create more wealth, be mindful of other sharers as it has been emphasized in the Quran itself. Wafi amwalikum haqqun. So there is a rightful share for others, those who ask, those who are deprived. This principle translated into finance tells us that we have to do something to make the financial community more responsible more socially aware. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the session 
is going to handle all these issues. Thank you very much.